Let's compare and contrast who the Bruins didn't recruit in 2023 versus who they actually brought in for Mick Cronin's squad and why it's really good that they did it here on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to the Locked On UCLA podcast. I'm your host, Zach Anderson Yoxheimer. Thanks for making this show your first listen each and every day. It's free wherever you get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. So like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for your support. Become an everydayer because you'll get to listen to all the fun UCLA content that I talk about, whether it's Mick Cronin's blasting of conference realignment or the eventual announcement of who UCLA's starting quarterback will be for 2023 in Week 1 versus Coast Carolina. Where we start today, I thought it'd be fun to compare and contrast what UCLA went after in terms of recruiting this year in 2023 for their class of 23 and who they actually brought in and why it's good, why it's interesting, and where those other recruits might be currently that the Bruins are striving so hard to get maybe as far back as 2021 with official visits, offers, and top fives, sevens, whatever it might be for some of these top name recruits. Because remember, Mick Cronin earlier earlier on, and it seemed like the Bruins, really struggled to get a lot of these 23 guys in. The first recruit uh, announcement was Devin Williams, followed by Brandon Williams, and then Mac. And then all of a sudden, the Bruins still had to get five more guys, if you include Lazar Stefanovic, in the transfer portal. So that was a lot of players the Bruins had to bring in, still being one player under the scholarship limit by the NCAA's maximum. And overall, the Bruins had some interesting choices where they swung and missed, maybe they didn't, and why it's good that they brought in the player that they did. So with no further ado, we're going to start with small forwards. And what's unique is based on whatever site you use, I use a lot of 24-7 sports and rivals and on three, but based on the small forward recruiting, the Bruins didn't actually officially bring in a small forward, depending on the combo guards and while there'll be players who can shift from the two to the three or players who might shift from the three to the four back and forth. The Bruins officially did not bring in someone technically who is listed as a small forward, at least on the sites I was using. So the Bruins went after, remember, 6'6", Andrei Stoyakovich, the four-star son of Peja Stoyakovich, a NorCal kid, someone who got the grades to even go into some of the higher top-tier academic institutions with the UCLA's, the Stanford's, and so on. And he was someone the Bruins are going after. And even if you looked at crystal ball, so, you know, projections, he was going to be a UCLA Bruin, much to our surprise to when he actually chose Stanford. And currently he still is going to Stanford, at least from what I've read recently. He's a four-star guy. And uh, when you're looking at the small forwards, who are players who could be a small forward, right? It could be at the, you know, as a three, anyone from Lazar Stefanovic, if they play him up to a three, V-Day could maybe range from one to three, maybe Fible as well. And then you've got Burke, who if the Bruins go big, they could have Bona, Mara, and then Burke as the three. If you get really crazy with 7-3, 6-11-6-10 with 6-9 Burke. And that's someone who you could get a lot of size after what they're going with Stoyakovic. So the Bruins could have a lot more size at the position, not that they would sacrifice that for the shooting that Stoyakovich could have brought. But still, the Bruins didn't truly bring in anybody. And if you remember, the last almost recruit before the end of the season, near the end of the regular season they went after, was Marcus Adams Jr., right? He was then the class of 24. In the process, as I was talking about, reclassifying from 23, the Narbonne High School kid from Harbor City, 6'8", small forward, classified from 24 to 23, a four-star kid, visited UCLA. There's a lot of hype. He was talking about it, had UCLA in his final two or three, saw the Pauly Pavilion was rocking. Everybody was giving him a good time, and it looked like he was a UCLA kid right in their own backyard. No official small forwards. Remember, this is before the V-Days, the Fibles. This is obviously before Stefanovic was in the transfer portal. And you had two power forwards in Williams and Brandon and Devin Williams at the time. Marcus Adams Jr. seemed all set, ready to go to UCLA, only to eventually say, I'm going to Kansas, where he committed and then decommitted after enrolling in the middle of the summer and then transferring to Gonzaga. So if you think about that alone, 
that already was a headache the Bruins had got to avoid. Not that international recruiting wasn't its headache as the Adeyemara, Adeyemara situation, the contract situation still plays out. But think, they wanted to get somebody. He's already committed, left school, and transferred before his freshman year even, even began. I know different situations require certain things more than it looks like on the exterior, so we don't want to put too much there. But just think, the Bruins kind of avoided some situations there. They got more size, maybe more options, and they brought in someone and brought in players who you would think might be there for a year or two and don't have to deal with a midsummer transfer situation like Adams Jr. did after committing and reclassifying to the class of 23. Now here's where the Bruins had some fun. You look at the power forwards, you look at their fours, they went after Ron Holland, the number two recruit overall in the class of 23. Five-star number two, top-tier power forward from Texas, 6'8", right? Maybe a little undersized, but uh, very athletic, very good. And then he had UCLA in his final three with Arkansas and Texas. Eventually committed to Texas in the fall of 2022 when the Bruins maybe had a chance. He had the home state kid, and he thought, all right, Ron Holland, we'll see what happens. He decommits eventually and then decides to go pro. So think of who the Bruins went after. They had Holland, and mind you, he's technically a power forward, so they already had a log jam with Devin Williams and Brandon Williams, both listed as power forwards. What Brandon, the 6'7 New York kid, and then Devin Williams, 6'11 power forward, probably a center in his future as well if he gets and puts on more pounds. But Cronin's already alluded to Brandon being a lot, going to have a lot of time to grow this chan- this time in Spain. And then Devin Williams, who is already high on his future, we talked about in the most recent episode of Locked On UCLA, which is why he should be an everydayer for the Locked On UCLA podcast, because Mick Cronin, with all his quotes, he had a good 18-minute interview with the media on August 17th. He talked about how Williams, once he puts on strength, will be very good. So here's two of those three recruits, right? You had someone who was crystal ball to UCLA, didn't go there. You had someone who looked like he was going to UCLA, reclassified, transferred after a commitment, someone who decommitted. I know the Texas situation is a little different in terms of what Ron Holland had to deal with, with all the the Chris Beard and all that that went on. But then he eventually decommitted and went pro. The Bruins still could have tried to grab him at the last moment when he decommitted. But Devin Williams, Brandon Williams, and that is all you guys have been talking about in the comments, Burke and William Tunchell, who is one of the three players that, Mick Cronin has alluded to this team that doesn't have available practicing three potential first round NBA picks. And I know a lot of you guys are very high on Burke. He is what is supposed to be maybe a bigger, better version of Jaime Hawkins Jr. in his freshman year as a lefty, 6'9, energetic out of Turkey. And we can't wait to see him in uniform. I watched some of his his highlights from Tofas on YouTube. And it's like, all right, this kid got some bounce. He's got some moves. So Burke, obviously I wasn't doubting him, but still they've got plenty of options, including immediate impact guys, future guys and different players who can be versatile, maybe from a three to a four, like Brandon Williams can be in his future. And depending on his development as a 17 year old freshman right now going and heading into Spain all with three guys who went different places for various reasons. But just look at that. You, you could have a first rounder for UCLA, potentially filling in for Holland, who's already chasing his pro dreams. And a couple of other guys, the Bruins can mix and match with separate options to fill that hole in the three, right? For the small forward opportunity. And then coming up next, we're going to talk about the guard, the combo guard options the point guards, which the Bruins didn't really recruit. And then we're going to talk about center, right? Because the Bruins had a little bit of an inkling towards the center, and then obviously we knew who the Bruins were going after when it was all said and done. We'll talk more about it and continue this process, who the Bruins went after a bit, who they got, and where's the comparison. We'll talk about that more here on Locked On UCLA. Welcome back. Let's take a look at eBay Motors, because if you're a championship team, you got to make sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle, right? Every part needs to fit just right, because you can go look in the portal. You can go look recruiting everywhere that Mick has been doing, but maybe not every piece is the perfect fit. That's why when you need the right parts and accessories, you head to eBay Motors, because with eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can make sure that every part you need fits right the first time around 
All you have to do is add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know if the part will fit or your money back, right? You don't get that in recruiting, but you can get this with eBay Motors because confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. They got over 120 million plus parts to choose from and you're back in the game in no time. It's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items apply and exclusions apply. Continuing on on the Locked On UCLA podcast, Zach Anderson, Yoxheimer, Yoxheimer with you guys. Sometimes I trip over my own name as well. Let's keep rolling because we talked about the power forwards and the small forwards already with you, what UCLA went after and who they brought in. And now let's take a look at the center. And the one center I thought UCLA was kind of going after, it's been a little bit, but Aaron Bradshaw, if you remember that name, it's because Bradshaw eventually committed to Kentucky top center. He's a seven-footer. Would have been UCLA's first seven-footer under Mick Cronin. His first in a long time in terms of recruiting guys seven feet or taller. He was the number one top center in 2023, five-star guy. And he did have UCLA in his top seven alongside the Kentuckys and then had the likes of the pro option of very other, various other schools. But then after a few official visits, a coach visit by uh, Calipari, then he eventually went to Kentucky, went there, and that's where he's continued his journey. UCLA, you're thinking, all right, how do you go from maybe being not necessarily in the precipice, but kind of on the outskirts of getting a top center in this class? They expected Bona to be gone, considering his Pac-12 Freshman of the Year award win this year and what he displayed. He could have been an NBA first rounder if he wasn't hurt, if not a fringe top tier second rounder. And who are they going to replace expecting Bona to be gone? All of a sudden, as we talked about, mystery, mystery recruit back in April, ready? Back in April and everything in between, you've got a Diamara who's still dealing with the goofy contract situation and leaving and having to get to UCLA a little later than Mick Cronin would have liked. But he is someone who I've already teased different draft mock experts and mock drafts for 24, which is supposedly a, a weaker class than in recent years for the NBA that'll be coming in. But for Mara, you've got someone who is lottery potential who could easily compete if he showcases the skills, the depth, the the flow, because he can easily be a four or a five offensively and defensively if they flip Mona based on what their role is on which side of the court. Mara is, you know, the Spanish savant potentially to come in and, and bring in some life. The first seven footer the Bruins have had under Mick Cronin and was one of the big key recruits in finishing off this class in the beginning of August and bringing it in. So someone who goes to Kentucky, all right, Kentucky's got those one and dones, but Mara brings us a lot of excitement. Cronin's still got to see him on the floor and we'll see how he can move up and down as a seven footer. Sometimes it's a little tougher to go up and down the floor back and forth. So you wonder how much Mara can bring on the floor, certain stints at a time, how many minutes he can play. But you would think, all right, when you go after a 740 and you bring in a 7-3, maybe more mobile. Not entirely sure about that, but has great passing instincts, good rim protector, and helps keep Bona maybe out of foul trouble this year. That's a really good bargain for UCLA when you bring in Bona and Mara compared to what they could have brought in with Bradshaw. And now you've got the combo guards and these kind of the ones and twos, maybe dare I say small forwards here. You brought, you had Chris Johnson and El Marco Jackson and online they had different th thoughts about V day, maybe a four star, maybe a three star V day listed at six, five, six, six, depends on what you want to use. And I'm thinking based on Mick Cronin's comments about how they need Sebastian Mack to score. You might see V day range from that one to two quite a bit back and forth. So El Marco Jackson and Chris Johnson, ironically in the same class, both committed to Kansas. Johnson decommitted to Kansas, and then I think it said he enrolled, but he decommitted and went to Texas. El Marco Jackson eventually committed to Kansas, and then the Bruins said, hmm, who's this slashing type guard that we need? Well, they did get Sebastian Mack, who could be one of those guys, but Mick Cronin wants to limit his role to a scoring type thing, so he'll be a two. And then you bring in Jan Vide who it might get more ball handling opportunity. Those are two guys who could split that combo guard role. And maybe those two players might not have fit in the system Cronin wants because he likes to, as he said, make it simple for the young players. You don't want them to be 
all right, a facilitator, a scorer, a defender, all these things. Of course, defense, defense is very important, but hey, how important is your role? What is your role on this team? And having two players like a V-Day and a Mac to bring it in are very important for moving forward. Overall, the top recruit in the class of 23 was a point guard. It was Isaiah Collier. The Bruins also went after Deedon Thomas, who eventually committed to UNLV. He did give some looks to UCLA. I believe UCLA was his last official visit, maybe, before he committed to UNLV. And then Collier, who was the top recruit, the Bruins were in on him. SC, they both had an official visit with Collier just within the few days of each other last year before he eventually chose the Trojans. And UCLA didn't bring in a true point guard, actually, in this class. Technically, I know Mac could be listed there. You've got even the likes of uh, Dylan Andrews, who is from last year's class that they probably expected to take over for Tiger Campbell. And then even Vide is going to step in as that combo guard. Collier would have been a great talent, great talent to bring. But now Mick Cronin's both relying on the talent he's brought in, Vide, Mac, maybe not so much the point guard, and then Dylan Andrews, who's going to get that opportunity to step up and shine in a new role. And guys who were giving looks to UCLA, but now you've got the Bruins who had so many options. Every single player that they went after, the Bruins could have arguably got someone better or have someone waiting in the wings that's better right now or will be better in the future. You could argue all those things. Not that the Stoyakovichs, the Adams Juniors, the Hollins, so on, the Colliers, they're not talented. But again, it's also the fit, right? You talk about the fit, the mixture, the culture. And Mick Cronin talked about his culture, wanted to go after less AAU guys, depending on the SoCal, uh, the SoCal bubble, if you will, how good's the SoCal talent, which is UCLA's recruiting base. The Bruins said, all right, we're going to go in the backyard. They'll get Devin Williams, technically Mac from Vegas, but California. And then you've got the likes of the New York product in Williams. They go across the globe, completely change the scope of their recruiting. And imagine thinking, oh, Stoyakovich was a Bruin. No, they missed on him. Adams thought they had him in the palm of their hand. Missed him. Holland, multiple chances to go after him in the summer and before then. Couldn't do it. Bradshaw, the Bruins had a look at him, but he was another Texas kid. And Coach Cal got his paws on him. And then Collier, you let your biggest rival across town get him. And it's like, wait a minute, what were the Bruins doing? Only is what I've said, when you re-rank these recruits in the class of 23 down the line based on impact, based on what happened either immediately or the next two to three years, uh, UCLA will probably have and should have maybe right now the top class of 23 based on the seven freshmen they brought in, not even including Lazar Stefanovic, the transfer. You mix that all together, and that's why we're all excited, right? Between three, two potential new recruits coming in that are first-round potential, V-Day, Fible, they've all gotten some NBA intangibles maybe as a second-rounder down the line in one to two years. Who knows what UCLA is going to have to replace once these players hopefully hit their full potential down the line as they go from Pac-12 to Big Ten and transition from year to year. I'm not sure what these Europeans are expecting in terms of a one-and-done jump or a two-year jump or maybe four years at UCLA. But overall, UCLA's got the blend of the talent. They've got guys who they can cycle in to have different looks to face small ball lineups, quicker lineups, bigger lineups, even a mixture of both. And they've got the guys who can have the skills that might fill some holes they didn't have last year. I think the Bruins will have a bit more shooting, maybe not as lights out as Singleton was last year individually, but they'll have a little more shooting. They should rebound better, and they should actually have a lot more si – obviously have a lot more size defensively and be way more athletic than a team that already was ex extremely good defensively last year. If they can learn the Cronin defense and play it well, this team will be extremely good. The only thing Cronin alluded to, a lot of these guys on this list can go get buckets. I'm not sure how – the Bruins are going to play in the flow of an offense and how the freshmen with a lot of load to carry a lot of, uh, it's a big burden to carry the offensive load. Like Max going to be asked to do amongst many with the post players, maybe being the emphasis this year in 2023, we'll see how the offense works. And once it clicks, the Bruins can also be unstoppable potentially, but that's all got to happen in time. They're going to take their, they're going to take their licks. They're going to struggle at times. But I think this team, based on when you go back to where the top recruits they're going after, some players they're so close at getting, 
I think UCLA ended up winning and they ended the end of the whole conversation. But we only will find out when they hit the court, put the balls in the basket, and all of a sudden who's cutting down the nets when it comes to winning a championship. One, two, who knows? Everything in between as we expect some excitement this year in 2023. Speaking of overall excitement, is UCLA football a top-tier program of all time, right? I know there's legendary Bruins, there's the Rose Bowl days, there's everything, the big move to the Rose Bowl. And what about UCLA being a top 25 program of all time? Let's talk about that because there's something that came out recently here on August 18th about that here on Locked On UCLA. Welcome back. Final segment of the Locked On UCLA podcast. Zach Anderson, Yox, I'm with you guys. Shifting to football, I know we're waiting for Chip Kelly to give us more tidbits. I know he even talked about uh, UCLA NIL beer names and everything in the most recent practice. And there's more drills to be looked at, a little more enticing moments quarterback-wise. But still, but we're, we're looking to figure out who is going to win the starting quarterback all the GoPros, which you see quarterbacks wearing, especially for UCLA for their data analysis, all the quarterbacks were looking at it. So Chip Kelly's giving everybody a look. We're all expecting it to be be between Garbers and more at this moment. Uh, I've been on the record. Again, I'll say it again. Bring on more. We'll see who the best player is for the job, at least when it comes to week one. But for now, we're still waiting for that response and that answer from Chip Kelly until the season starts September in early September against Coastal Carolina. Something I thought that was interesting that came out, I think 24-7 Sports posted a, an, ar- an article based around this poll put together by College Football Now, I think was the site. And it was, who are the top 25 programs all time based on their AP top 25 finishes, which has been around since the mid-1930s. So based on a point system between those couple of sites, it was... If you get a point for being a 25 team when you finish the season or get 25 points for number one, of course, that's very subjective. So this is a very subjective list as to, all right, is UCLA good? How long have they been good based on certain years? Recent relevancy, which we hope they pick it up moving into the Big Ten. But overall, UCLA in a list of top 25 programs, all time based on AP top 25 finishes and where they finished is a top 20 program. They're amongst the ranks just behind Clemson and Miami. Remember the U, you have Clemson who won one national title, what, in the 80s or something, and all of a sudden they've come into relevancy recently, right? So they've gotten a lot more points based in the last decade plus under Dabo Sweeney. And then the Bruins are interestingly ahead of Michigan State. They're ahead of Arkansas, Texas A&M, Washington, and Wisconsin, right? Those are where UCLA slots in based on where they finished, how they've succeeded. And while, you know, there's some moments, Rose Bowl glory, maybe some not, the Bruins have been a consistent team where in terms of 32 finishes, 32 times in the history of the AP poll, UCLA has been a top 25 finisher, seven weeks at number one. I believe there's been 39 times I was looking up that UCLA was a top 25 finisher. And a preseason top 25, so ironically that there's a little mixture there. UCLA not in the top 25 this year, but overall, the Bruins have been a more consistent program. It's been a battle between them and the the, the other, you know, schools with the, with that color across town, right? With, with the, the crimson and all of the gold, whatever, in the Coliseum. And they've been battling for years and years, even sharing a home before, as I said, last year in one of our first YouTube Locked on UCLA episodes that the greatest thing UCLA did, maybe second to their move to the Big Ten, is what was their move to the Rose Bowl into claiming a home, which now we have different opinions potentially now. But that was the big move that transitioned into a Rose Bowl game appearance, into a dominant stretch against USC, into some dominance into the 80s and 90s, and even some early 2000s glory there. But UCLA, maybe despite all our you know, negative Nancy, negative, you know, just negativity sometimes about the lack of uber success that the Bruins could have had over the year, being in SoCal, playing at the Rose Bowl for quite so many years now. They've been a good team. It's just, can they take that next step? Is the Big Ten move this next step? Clearly, they're a program that's recognized, that's viewed, maybe not taken seriously on a year-to-year basis based on what they've done transitioning from 
early 2000s into now 2023 over the last 15, 17, 20 years. And there's been some lulls in certain seasons where there are high expectations for the Bruins, especially lack of bowl wins, lack of Rose Bowl opportunities, lack of competition or winning in the Pac-12 because the Bruins have not won the Pac-12 just yet. They've had those early Pac-12 championship appearances before the Pac-12 eventually disintegrated and before our very eyes, mostly due to UCLA and SC moving to the Big Ten with all the other schools jumping ship. But UCLA is a good program, whether it's us young fans trying to remember the glory days, whether it's the older generation saying they were good and they haven't been good recently, or even the long-term UCLA fans, the long-term, you know, the Ed Kazarians, right? Coach K of UCLA talked about the glory days, the Terry Donahue's, right? Who's going to get that statue as a longtime UCLA dominant coach. Oh, the, the glory days that have stretched even longer than we realize. It's sometimes a good reminder that maybe they've had a lot of good times and that good times are beginning to follow that they're a top 20 program of all time, not just top 25, top 18, based off where they finished subjectively in the top 25 of the AP poll over the years. So it's interesting to think about, hey, man, hey, while we haven't gotten fans, while we haven't had the support, there should be that, and there should be a better experience as a UCLA fan going forward, but we got to make it believe and remember, hey, there have been some great UCLA players, and there will be more to come. And, hey, let's do it. It's interesting. Based off a study that was posted, I think, between College Football Now is the site and the 8 and the 24-7 sports that wrote the article about, hey, UCLA, wow, interesting. Sandwich in between the Clemsons and Miamis and the Michigan States, the Arkansas, the NAM. So the Big Ten schools already, the SEC schools, and some powerful ACC schools. It's interesting to see how much recent relevancy brings it in. A decade of dominance can really put you near the top. And that's what the Bruins need to set themselves up for future success, which wherever college football looks like, with the 12-team playoff, with the miniature conferences, everything in between starts now, as they can maybe leap even higher in that list in years future. That's going to do it for us here on Locked On UCLA. Thanks for tuning in all week. If there's more news, if there's more breaking news, we'll get it right to you as quickly as we can, which is why you've got to become an everydayer of the Locked On UCLA podcast. You would have seen Mick Cronin's comments you would have seen everything in between comparing and contrasting who the Bruins didn't get versus who they did get this year in their basketball recruiting and football's around the corner. The Coastal Carolina preview is about to drop pretty soon in the next week plus. So get excited, get pumped for those. And UCLA fans, hit that subscribe button, that download button, wherever you're watching this, if you're listening to it, thank you very much. If you got some reviews, leave them. And one final note, I have looked for maybe streams. I have looked for any links. I have not seen any for UCLA's upcoming exhibition games in Spain. So I've not seen that. If UCLA's Twitter decides to post it, we will try and talk about it. But I have not seen any types of links or streams to their Spain trip. So that's all I've got for now. I don't think they'll be sending Josh Lewin to do radio from the airbox of some Spanish arena. And we'll see how that goes. There have been other teams that have played the same teams UCLA is playing, and they've had very low-quality streams if one of the two or three games were streamed. But we'll see. I haven't seen any streams listed anywhere. So that's your answer if you've asked or wondered if there's any way to watch. Not really an answer right now until the games, until the Bruins get there, will we find out. So hands up, Bruins fans. Zach anderson Yoxheimer signing off. A clap time, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you. See, LA, UCLA, fight, fight, fights. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins.